This morning, as I said earlier, we're going to enter into a story, an event, a moment in the life of Jesus Christ, probably the most mystical, mysterious, and I believe profound, one of the most profound moments in his journey here on earth. The story conveys a powerful truth about the nature of the being of Jesus. I want to begin by just reading that story to you. Um, the setup is Jesus has uh, now already called all of his disciples. They've been journeying with him for a while. And in this journey, progressively discovering more and more about who he is, who he really is. And just before the transfiguration event, which will be the last part of what I'm going to read, Peter, one of his disciples, has a huge aha moment and says and sees what reality really is regarding who Jesus is. So I'm going to read that to you, and your job is to become a ten-year-old and let your imagination run free if you can, if you dare, and uh, close your eyes if you want and listen to the story through your ears and uh, go there with this crowd of people following after this rabbi teacher, uh, trying to make sense of who he is and what he's saying and what's happening around you. Um, arid, dry, Middle Eastern Palestine. And try to get a read for yourself on who he really is. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man himself is? They replied, some think he's John the baptizer, some say the prophet Elijah, some say the prophet Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He pressed them, and how about you, you, who, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself let you in on this secret of who I really am. Some of you, you, standing here, are going to see it take place. You're going to see the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. And then they realized that Moses and Elijah were there also in deep conversation with him. Peter broke in. Master, this is a great moment. What do you think? I'll build three memorials here on the mountain, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was going on like that, babbling, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them, and sounding from deep in the cloud, a voice. This is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. And when they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus.
I love this painting by Duccio de Buon Insegna. Practiced that all week. Did it come off smoothly? It did. With a bit of an Italian lilt to it, I thought it did. Duccio, as he's affectionately known, uh, painted the Transfiguration for a church in Siena, Italy, back in the 14th century as part of a greater altarpiece that he did. And some say that this particular part of that altarpiece is the best he's ever done, one of his greatest works. Clockwise, starting with, you guys have already figured out where Jesus is in the painting. Clockwise from Jesus, Elijah the prophet holding a scroll, the Word of God. And then below him, James, with one hand seemingly raised to Jesus and the other held out to you guys over here. Beside him, John, who is proximally closest to Jesus, the one he loved. Beside him, Peter, with his hand raised on bended knee, humbled Peter, and then above Peter, Moses, the one to whom God gave the law, the Ten Commandments. Moses met God 14 centuries earlier on a mountain called Mount Sinai. Elijah, the prophet, met God nine centuries earlier on the same mountain, now renamed and called Mount Horeb. The disciples are meeting Jesus for who he really is, God with them, Jesus in his glory, Jesus through whom all things were made, Jesus for whom everything in the universe exists, the Lord of all creation, on a mountain. And now we, because we've all entered into this story, are meeting Jesus, the real Jesus, on a mountain. We believe in the Holy Spirit, we say in the Nicene Creed. We believe that Jesus by that Spirit and the Father by that Spirit is present here now everywhere. We believe that only the Holy Spirit can open up a sinner, a broken person, uh, a me, my eyes, so that I can really see who the real Christ is. If any of us in this room, right now, really knew who Jesus Christ was, we would be on the floor like those disciples, smitten, awestruck, like the prophet Isaiah, we'd bring our hands to our mouths and say, woe is me, I'm a woman of unclean lips, and I live among a congregation of unclean people, and I'm looking at the holiness of God. In her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk, Pulitzer Prize-winning author Annie Dillard wrote this. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear lady straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us, lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us to where we can never return. In the story of the Transfiguration, God, through Christ, draws us to a place that you can never return from. Can you feel the glory? Can you feel it? Can you, are you understanding 
what this story is saying? Have you entered into Jesus' story? In the transfiguration moment, via a, I guess, collective moment of vision, all six of these persons are there in the same place at the same time. And if we've all entered in, that means there's 156 of us in the story there for a timeless God. Moses in the 14th century, Elijah in the 9th century BCE, Peter, James, and John, 30 CE, Chuck, Curtis, and Julie, 2012 CE, and all the rest of us there. There before the great I am that I am, the timeless one the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of God the Father, part of an eternal trinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit, timeless, spaceless God, omni-everything, omnipresent God with us. The God of Moses, who spoke to him and gave him the law, saying, this is the way, live this way, That God is your God right now. And saying to you, love me with all of your heart, all of your heart, all of you, all of your being, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The God of the prophet Elijah, who called him to speak God's words in power, to step out in faith and risk his life and call reality in its brokenness and in its beauty for what it is, is the same God who calls you. And he says, Evelyn, be my voice in the places in the world that I put you. Michael, you do it there. You speak for me because we're all prophets, the Bible teaches. The God of Peter, who to Peter's very reluctant and prideful spirit and body, he got before him on his knees and washed his feet one night and taught him a huge lesson about who Jesus really is and humility the God whose selfless power is found in the glory of service, calls to you, says you on your knees in your life, in terms of how you treat her and your family and the people you work with and your neighbor. Do you have any idea how much I love the people that I put around you at school, at work, in your church? The God of John, who let him, reclining after the meal in that one Bible story, lean on his chest. I want to be there one day. (laughs) I want to be that guy. He says to you, come, you can lean on me. (laughs) I am strong. I will hold you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come close. I love you. And the God of James, who took an unschooled fisherman out of his boat and made him the leader of the Jerusalem church, the main church as Christendom started to play out 2,000 years ago, was headed up by this unschooled, Fisherman, that God says to you in your, oh, I really don't know theology much. I I really don't know God much. I don't really have much to give. You 
and says, follow me. You ordinary person, you, I have a big plan for you to prosper you, to give you a life, to give you a life in abundance. And James's hand seems to be blessing you. And Jesus is raising a hand in blessing to you. And he's looking out, eyes forward, not directly forward, if you look at the painting really closely. And I wondered, what's that all about? Because it would make my sermon point much better if you were looking directly forward. Then I thought maybe Duccio knows more than this pastor does about what it means and doesn't mean about the holiness of Christ. And can you look him in the eyes now, veiled in mortal flesh? Eyes forward, hand raised in blessing, carrying the Word of God, real gold used to paint the highlights of His robe. His clothes were filled with light, sunlight pouring from His face, changed from the inside out, Jesus filled with glory. Again, The same one who said to James, follow me, says to you, follow me. He loves you just as much as he loved John. He calls you to humility as incisively and in your face as he does and did to Peter. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Same authority. The Jesus who is the fulfillment of the law, all of the law, every law and everything that was spoken by any judge throughout the history of the Old Testament, and the prophets, all of the prophets together, and all that was said and all that they pointed to, the fulfillment in Jesus Christ of the law And the prophets is the Jesus who is here by his spirit who addresses you. I find that totally mind blowing. That the Jesus that we believe speaks to you in your life is is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mysteriously present to Abraham and Moses and Elijah and those guys. At the, he's outside of it all, time and space. Like, I get why Peter was such a dork and wanted to go build memorials and didn't know what to do. <laughs> like, mind blown by what was playing out before them. And how did he know they were just Elijah and Moses? Something about the glory of the presence of Jesus that illumines reality so that you know. And while Peter was going on like that, babbling, a light radiant cloud enveloped them, envelops us, and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight, listen, listen, listen to him. Listen to him as he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Very truly, very truly, I tell you, all who have faith in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and sending my Spirit 
among you. The same God who spoke through the burning bush speaks at your work at that moment where you know that you know that you know. The same God who spoke with a still small voice through a parable and a miracle and a wisdom teaching speaks to you. I wrote a chapter in my book two years ago on the timelessness of God. I thought it was the best chapter, and the editor goes out. That's way too abstract and weird and complex, and how do you really know how it all works regarding timelessness? So I've made a vow to include portions of that chapter in sermons over the next five years to make sure it does get published somewhere. But regarding this timeless point and God's words... His words are just as authoritative now as they were then. God means what he says just as much now as he did then. It's just as important that we hear his words now as it was for the Bible's protagonists to hear them then. Biblical times were not more important times than the times we're now living. The history that's played out, that played out then, is just like the history that is playing out now. The people who populated the Bible's pages were real people like you and I. They weren't born saints. They didn't possess any more super spiritual potential than you do. Yes, they lived out a deep faith in God, and yes, they did miraculous things as a result, but they were just ordinary, sinful, broken, falling short human beings just like you and me. They were all of that, but we should also remember that we're also like them in terms of the potential of what a human life can be and what God can do in and through you. And arguably, given what we just read from Jesus about when he sends a spirit, you'll do even more than me. We've been given eyes and ears to see and hear and know and do in ways maybe beyond some of those Old Testament characters. God hasn't lowered the bar in terms of what he hopes to accomplish in his world. Why would God have? And why would he expect anything less from you in your small, mere, meager, mortal life? Poet Blake wrote these words which came to mind. He said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man and to woman as it is, infinite. If we had any idea of the voice that is speaking through the cloud, if we had any idea that that was true, if we had any idea that this is his son, marked by his love, focus of his delight. If we had any idea, I'm sure we would listen to him. Let's pray. Heather's going to lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. This is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. We pray, Lord, for the eyes that the disciples had, the same eyes to see you, only you. When we do encounter your glory, as the disciples did, it is frightening, almost unbearably so. But thank you that you come to us and touch us and invite us to trust you, to not be afraid.
that your love is so vast that it holds us in our fear, in our brokenness, in our longing for you, in our uncertainty. and in our potential, in our gifts, in all the ways that we've been made to reflect your image to the world. We pray that you will help us in the mundane moments of our life, not just in the mountains, to open our eyes and to see you, only you. Amen.